and we are up. This is episode number 30. This is a milestone episode. Three zero is a is a good luck number. Every time I jump rope, I get excited. <laughs> I usually do like reps of a hundred. You do and not. I You're do. lying. I do. Don't don't say too much yet, Paul. I gotta oh. I gotta introduce you here shortly. But uh, I get excited when I get to tens and then you twenties and thirties and then I gotta get to a hundred. It's uh, easier to do it in tens. So uh, coming to you from North Alabama, this is the Our Town Podcast. And I want to just continue to mention that we now have chapters. As the episodes get longer, there is that need to allow you all to be able to navigate quickly, easily to the part of the show that may be most interest to you if you don't have time to listen to it all. Right. So on YouTube, you'll see that kind of broken out in those little rectangle. You can ho- hover over each of those little rectangles right. down in the timeline and it will uh, tell you whatever that uh, I've named that chapter. That's great. And then what I do is in the show descriptions on all the audio platforms, people can go in in that description area and see the narrative form of the timeline. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. And so uh, the other thing I want to point out, this is the this is the second episode now sponsored by episode 29 was sponsored by Ignite. And this Wonderful. is episode 30 sponsored by Revolved Realty. So my friend, good friend Tim Knox, he was on episodes. 13 and 14 back to back. Okay. Um, he has a really awesome business here yeah. that he started because of kind of a different business model for real estate and has a lot of agents. Okay. And so, uh, and he'll be coming onto the podcast. I think we're going to do a show quarterly. With oh, him. good. And good. so, yes. Part of uh, what I would consider that will be a little bit different where I'll kind of hand him an HDMI cable and okay. let him kind of drive the show as well, kind of co host it. Interesting. Because he has a lot of content on the real estate market sure. and he has his own YouTube channel and things like that. So uh That's fantastic. That'll be uh that'll be fun. And then this episode, who's that voice you hear? It's Paula Namchef. And uh I'm not sure, quite frankly, Paula, how many people know you in Huntsville, but you do have a national brand. I you do. you have done done things nationally or, or at least in Tennessee. You spent yes, some time regionally. up in there. Mm-hmm. But uh Tala Paula Namchef is here. And she is a, you consider yourself, I had to look at your couple different sources to say, okay, what, what do I give you as a title? I know. Are you going to give me one today? Because I'd like one. Well, you're a uh, <laughs> food and lifestyle influencer and a content creator. Right? I am. Creative content. That's exactly what I do. How are you? I'm great. I'm so glad to be here, Troy. Good. Yeah. You're killing it. Am I? Yeah. Our town is really growing. I can see it. And it's... Exciting time for you. You deserve it. Oh, I appreciate it. Yeah. It's, it's, and thank you for having me on. I'm glad to be here. May I, anybody that's uh, willing to carve out some time to come on is a good thing. It's nice that the, the fall weather is starting to, to come in. Yeah, it's beautiful outside. And as I mentioned, uh, this is going to be a kind of considered a showcase episode. This might be our first, what I would consider a showcase episode, where this will be a little different. Okay. Um, typically, oh, I have pictures that we'll use in the pick six at the end of the program. Right. But because your business is very much dependent on what visually people yes. see, right? Where you're trying to sell yes. whether it's fashion or food mm-hmm. or something with lifestyle or right. cooking. Um, we have lots of pictures that ultimately we will will showcase in this episode and we'll spend a little bit more time c- going through those that you feel I think there might be 30 or so, okay. tw- 20 to 30, Terrific. and have you comment on. Okay, I'd love that. And otherwise, you know, you have you have a lot of YouTube content and such. But um, so, it's, it's getting there. So how do you how do you describe to those in Huntsville kind mm-hmm. of uh, kind of who you are as far as what you're doing day to day in your business? Right. Well, it's it's a great thing to be doing because Creating content is all about creativity, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, my content is food-based, artisan food, or elevated comfort food. That's a lot of the things that I do. Um, Elevated. I've never heard that term. Yeah, elevated comfort food. So, you know, like a typical casserole. I might have some different spices in there. I do it a different way. But comfort food is something people love and they they enjoy it Mm -hmm. it's it's um it takes us back you know and that's one thing that i'm really 
focused on is food memories for people, uh, what that elicits in them. And it's amazing to learn about people and see how food, whether it's their, with their family or experiences that they've had, how it affects them mm-hmm. and how much they enjoy it. So for me, it's a thrill to be a food content creator to provide them uh, some really good content. And I do I do savory and sweet mm-hmm. foods. Um, I think my uh, predilection is is breads. I just think that they're sexy, and mm-hmm. I teach bread classes and. People come in and they say, I, I'm not creative. I can't do this. And I say, just watch. Yeah. If you can't, by the time you leave, I've failed you mm-hmm. and I'm not going to fail you. So so there's that. And then the other thing I'm doing now. Hold on real quick. Yeah. Let's go back to this food memory. Yeah. Because So do people come to you and say, hey, I grew up on this kind of diet and these kinds of foods that my mom or my dad or whomever made for me on a regular basis. Can you help me to go back in the time machine, if you will, and introduce those in recipes? Yes. Is that part of it where you're? Yes. Yes. That's part of it. I I get inspiration from everybody telling me what it is that's important and poignant to them when it comes to food. And it can even just be things like, what was the food, the first food you remember that blew your mind? Yeah. You know, tell me about that. Tell me that was what that was all about. You can see there, those are my focaccia gardens. Those are mm-hmm. somewhat of a new trend. Um, and I love creating those. They're just, they're a very creative process and anyone can do it. And it just elevates the bread to a, you know, to a different level. Yeah. Love doing that kind of stuff. So. And what she's referring to for those listening um, on the viewing platform. Yeah. On Spotify or YouTube, I'll always, well, not always. I try to have a slideshow. Yes. Is, this is and great so stuff. They, unbeknownst to the guest. They'll send me things, and a lot of times I'll pop on to like they have a Facebook page or Instagram right, or Twitter, right. and they'll just start ripping photos down and nice. um, and pop those in there, right? Yeah, so that yeah. that uh, the viewer has a little bit more to to look at. I love that. Thank you for doing that. It's yeah. a lot of work, but it's great. So, what is one of those foods that you remember that just oh my god knocked your socks off when you were growing up? I have a I have a uh, short list I could share with yeah, you. Yeah, because I I want to hear that yeah. for sure. Well. Uh, for me, I was just a food geek. Like even as a young child, when, when I was in first grade, you remember show and tell? Of course. So our show and tell assignment was to bring in a food we love and talk about why we love it. Okay. So here I am, a six-year-old girl, and I, I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> I bring to school a cereal called it's called bran buds or bran flakes bran flakes i mean it's yeah you know a six-year-old bringing in bran flakes looks a little weird sounds a little weird is a little weird people are like yeah yeah okay like, okay what is this where's the cheerios yeah where where's the cheerios and where's the milk man <laughs> what are you doing <laughs> and so this was my this was my reasoning for it when i discovered my dad used to eat that cereal all the time so it was in the house so I tried it one time, and I'm I'm really in tune to flavor. Mm-hmm. I always have been, and I I said, "Ooh, this this has like a and literally said this. This has a nuance of malt in it. I mm. really like that." So I went to school and I told them that, and they all looked at me like I was insane. Now, what grade were you in, and how old? First grade. First grade. So you're six years old. So I'm six years old. Wow. Yeah. So I got labeled as a weirdo really early. Most people. Potentially had never even heard of malt, right? Or uh, no, other no. Other than like a malt milkshake or something. Well, exactly. They had no, no, no clue about what the essence was that I was speaking <laughs> of. But you know, it was it, it made for a story. I think people gave me a hard time about that for a month or so, and they so should did, have. But did your parents or whomever was close to you recognize? Wait a minute. I'm assuming you came home and told them yeah. this experience. Told yes. someone. Yes. And they look at you like you you have a gift. Well, they looked at me first like, that's not the appropriate thing to do for show and tell. But, you know, <laughs> if you're going for it. And they knew I was kind of eccentric in my own little way. So, okay. um, and, and it's interesting because my father, he has a background owning a, a restaurant in Detroit. His father, we can get into that later. He mm-hmm. was a restaurateur. And so he was, he was very attuned to, 
subtleties like that. And he appreciated that. You know, I think he appreciated, hey, my first, you know, first grade daughter is going in here and she's going to have the guts to talk about malt flavoring yeah. in a dry cereal that people use when they're constipated. And were you in, <laughs> were you in Detroit at this time? No. I've, I was born and raised here in Huntsville, Alabama. You were? Okay. And you know what that's called now? If you're born and raised here, since there's such an influx of people from all over. Well, I'm assuming it's, it's going to be an answer. I don't. I, so, like, you're not a native. No. Not a Huntsvillian. No. You're really close. It's it's a little bit more powerful. It's You're a Huntsville proper. Huntsville proper. I'm Huntsville proper. Okay. That's cool. So <laughs> yeah. he had a restaurant in Detroit before. You, yeah. you came into the picture. Yes. He grew up in Detroit and Ann Arbor. Okay. His father immigrated from Macedonia okay. in 1924, I think, and settled in Detroit. And so he had Detroit's, uh, he had restaurants, like he had the Ann Arbor restaurant in the 60s. Uh, he had a restaurant in West Palm Beach. He had restaurant in restaurant or two in Detroit. And it was really an interesting thing about my father here. Mm-hmm. So my dad didn't grow up in any conventional way. His father, being a restaurateur, he was divorced from his mother. And he was, he was living with my father because my grandmother, who was Macedonian, had said, my son, my dad, will never be Americanized. Hmm. And that wasn't a good thing, you know, because he he had to learn English and he had to assimilate into America. Yeah. And so they had, you know, they had a a tough divorce and my dad lived with my father, but my, um, my grandfather, my grandfather lived in hotels. So my dad grew up in hotels. It was Hmm. just kind of an odd situation. And he was, he was brilliant, just absolutely brilliant. He he left uh, University of Michigan. Mm-hmm. He was working on his master's degree in mathematics. I can't understand that. I don't know why anybody would do that. Mm-hmm. But he just, that was his gig, right? He was a mathematical genius. And NASA came calling on him in around 1958, you know, with the beginning of Marshall Space Flight Center yeah. and NASA. And he was one of the original rocket scientists that worked for Werner von Braun. Hmm. So he he came here to Huntsville and started a family here and never left. Loved Huntsville, loved his job at NASA, everything about it. He was responsible for the Apollo space missions. He had many patents. But we never knew about that because he was not braggadocious. He would never, mm. he would never, you know, talk about that kind of thing. He really didn't talk about work much. But yeah, he he was, he he had when he before he did his master's in math, he owned part restaurant in the theater district of Detroit, and he saw some great stuff. Mm. He saw a lot of theater people. He met a lot of people. It's really energizing, cool vibe, but he knew that's not what he wanted to do for a living. He yeah. saw the demands of it, you know, yeah. crazy, crazy, and he knew that he wanted to be a scientist. So went to University of Michigan, actually stopped the master's degree program to come here to Huntsville, to be a part of, of, you know, where, like I say, NASA claimed a city for its own. Yeah. And that was the beginning of, of him. So he appreciated the fact that I loved food and he challenged me a lot uh, to, to try to be creative and, and, and gave me difficult things to see if I could uh, pull through and do it. Okay. You know? So you're born in Huntsville. Yes. He's here working for NASA. Yes. Yes. You're a little girl when the... Um, Space landing. Yes, absolutely. Tell me about that experience with your father. Oh, my God. Well, my father, he, this is the thing about NASA in those old days. And I know it sounds archaic, but it's true. So a lot of the men and some women, of course, um, they would communicate in their NASA offices. There'd be just an expansive office there, right? Mm -hmm. And they would communicate back and forth. They had strings set up like on the walls. It sounds nuts, but mm-hmm. it's the truth. And they would do little messages 
that needed to be immediately handled. And back in those days, he'd put it on that string and just fly that string over okay. to the next person. That's what they they just fly that string over to take, you know, to take messages. But yeah, he was, he was, um, it was an exciting time for him. He did not share a lot about what he did. Mm-hmm. I think because he just loved it so much and knew it was the mission, you know, he's focused on, and you know, all of the Apollo missions, he had the briefcase with all the Apollo stickers, yeah. you know, for all of those. And, um, he was a very interesting, smart, dedicated man, but he didn't have, I wrote a little bit about him uh, on my website because I love to write. And I wrote about how he, you know, at, at home, I don't know how it was for you, but being born and raised and there's four kids in the family, my dad, when I was younger, he just, he always seemed like pissed off for no reason when he'd come home. Like yeah. everybody's like, go to your room. Right. Cause he was just exhausted and it was kind of a traditional family setup at that time. And so he, he seemed humorless to me sometimes, but mm. then I also was very close to him and I saw his humor. Well, I used to go to Marshall space flight with him when I was a little girl and I was blown away because I saw my dad in his element. Yeah. Loving work, cutting up. I'm like, who is this man? Yeah, <laughs> it was beautiful. It was beautiful to see him take such love and pride in what he did. Yeah, in a personal way, yeah. you know, where it was really poignant to him. It wasn't, hey, I'm doing this. Hey, I'm doing that. We'd never heard anything like that. We just, we just knew what he was doing. And but then, did you gather around the TV to watch the moon landing? Yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely, we did. That was that was historic. And was he in that and in, in a gleeful zone, kind of like what you were say, just t- describing at work? Yes. You saw. Yes. Did you see something different in him when that was being broadcast? Yeah, yes, and it wasn't like an enjoyable viewer. It, I mean, he. It was happening, and he was proud of all of it, but he didn't have the zeal and enthusiasm of like, well, look at look what we did. He just, mm. he was just, he was very subdued. Watched it, and was, you know, gleeful toward the end. Probably had a yeah. cocktail. You know, he might have just, just been happy. more concerned. I, I believe that's a knowing big all case the factors, it. right? That things that could have gone wrong. Yes, yes, that just, absolutely. That's part of the 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 thing that I want everyone to know about my father was that that was the interesting juxtaposition of going to NASA as a little girl with him and seeing him cut up and then also realizing that they knew the gravity of what they were doing. Yeah. They knew they were changing this city and they were the ones responsible for it. And you know, that's cool. Mistakes and they're disastrous. Right. And everybody has to work together as a team. It, it, it was a really cool time. Do me a favor. Push down on the, the top. No, no, no. Like the very top. Push this? down on that. Yeah. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Let's get it lower because I think you're... There you go. Is that good? That's perfect. Okay. Because now that should be a little more comfortable for okay. you. Okay. Yeah, that's... Yeah, it feels better. I so, hope I don't hit it with my lips. It's okay. <laughs> now, you you had just kind of touched on um, NASA material and stuff, but so I understand mm-hmm. there was an episode where he was arrested. Oh, my God. Can you tell that story? Yeah. So... I'd heard the story from my dad, but I wanted to get it from my uncle Uh because my uncle, his brother, they lived together in Detroit. My uncle remained in Detroit, but my dad was at NASA, right? So he, he was, it was just a couple years after he'd been living in Huntsville and at NASA and he drove his car to Detroit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because he wanted to see his brother, and for some reason, his brother wanted him to borrow his car. I don't, <laughs> I don't understand that part, but that was the, kind of the lowdown. So he went, to, he went to Detroit, he went to Ann Arbor, but when he was in Detroit, he parked his car, he got out, and he jaywalked. And my dad looked Macedonian or mm-hmm. Greek, you know, depending on who owns the real estate at the time, and so they. They arrested him for jaywalking, which I'm like, wow, that's kind of harsh. Yeah. <laughs> Slow month in the precinct. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Who's that foreign man? So they took him back to his car, and they saw in the back seat 
these photos from different like lunar landing and all, all kinds of stuff about NASA, just, just pictures. Mm-hmm. And my dad was not, I mean, he was a devout man and he followed the rules and he was not in any way um, flippant with his job. He knew the responsibility. So those pictures were not classified, mm-hmm. but you can imagine the class, class rating that he had to get this job with NASA. I mean, it was absolutely insane. And so they arrested him. They didn't know. And then they called little old NASA. <laughs> <laughs> My dad was absolutely frightened by all this because he, he, he didn't want to be at risk of his job and he didn't do anything wrong. Mm-hmm. So what my uncle said was they took him to his car and searched the car and found some pictures from Redstone article, Redstone Arsenal, sorry. They took him into custody and contacted NASA. It was a big deal before for your dad because he landed a job he loved and was concerned this could jeopardize his position yeah. at NASA. Detroit police found these pictures um, and They were nothing special, secret, or classified. The incident made television news in Detroit, and he wanted nothing to do with speak speak to the press. He just he he didn't he still to the just as he wasn't that type of a guy. He wasn't an extrovert, Mm -hmm. and so he hid out at his dad's place for days, where people were trying to contact him, and it was it was treated as like a light, soft story. Um, there for the television uh, stations, but it was really, it was scary for my dad. Yeah. Um, he was new to the job and he was afraid that something would happen and he'd get in trouble. He didn't care about being arrested, just wanted to be cleared. And they cleared yeah. him and everything was fine, but it was just funny that, you know, it's Michael Namshef and his birth given name, get ready for this, was Noomsho Namshef. Noom. <laughs> yeah, Noomsho Namshef. So when he went into the army, he changed his name to, he's like, mm, what's a good name? How about Mike? <laughs> so Michael go. was his name from then on out. But the Namshef kind of freaked, you know, the police out. And you can understand that. And it, it was at the time of the Cold War, too. So sure. with all of that intensity. So he, you know, he, he just, he was just, he was so funny about the fact that his fear was so strong about that. But then also he was like, what the hell? Why, yeah. why is this on me? <laughs> you yeah. know? So yeah, that was an interesting story. And I actually made the today show before the today show was video when it was just, I guess, talk radio, mm-hmm. I would assume. And they mentioned it just a little bit and said, you know, yeah. the guy, the guy was fine. He lives in Huntsville, Alabama. He's an aerospace engineer for NASA. None of the stuff was classified. Yeah. There were pictures, actually, he was giving his brother in Detroit when he came there. So, I yeah. Used, yeah. I used to uh, work in the Intel community up in D.C., and I always felt bad for wow. those poor people that were like visitors, and they were trying to find like Chick-fil-A or something, or, <laughs> yeah. you know, or a Wendy's or yeah. just a TJ Maxx. And right, they they right. end up turning into the into a complex, and they don't have a badge, and they get guns oh. drawn on oh, them. Oh, no. You know, and they just... But you know there has oh, to be some there has to be some level of vetting, right? right. Well, exactly, there does. But <laughs> you see the terror on their faces. <laughs> They're like, they am I getting wrong turn? vetted for McDonald's? Yeah, I just want a burger somewhere. <laughs> um, so let's uh, let's so where did you go to high school here? Grissom, Grissom, Grissom High okay. School. Yeah. Um, and then so let's talk about how you ultimately ended up in Memphis. Yeah, because you had you had your own. That's it. Was that where you first started into your own restaurant yes, business? Yes. Yes. Exactly. Let, let's do that. Okay. So I want to follow this thread the of of the food. We're just the. You know, your dad had a restaurant. Right. What kind of food was he serving, by the way? It was a pizza joint. And everywhere? even the, You said it, he had one in Florida? It, well, no, my grandfather. Your my grandfather, grandfather had okay. a seafood restaurant. He had, it was like the the, the Ann Arbor restaurant was a, a diner. It was mm-hmm. like a, just a diner. And then uh, he did the Friendly Cafe in... Uh, Palm, in P- West Palm Beach. West Palm. And I always wonder what that property value is now. Sure. So I have pictures of the outside of it. Um, and and his, you know, he did a little bit of Greek food, a lot of casseroles, um, fine pastries. So, you know, it was kind of, it was in my blood for my grandfather. And then my dad loved to cook. He just didn't do a lot of cooking 
during the week because he was so busy. But sure. holidays and weekends, he loved to experiment with flavor, et cetera, et cetera. So getting back to me, graduated from Grissom. Okay. Went to University of Alabama in Huntsville. Well, did you yeah. work in any restaurants along the way as a, in part-time capacity? Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> I worked for Baskin Robbins scooping ice cream. That was my first job when I was fifteen. Okay. I was like, I got somewhat of a food service. Uh, somewhat, <laughs> you know. I and I gained ten pounds in like yeah. six months. So you know, you just have carte sure. blanche with all that ice cream. But so I did that, um, and then I left to go to Memphis when I married. I was mm-hmm. twenty-one, very young, and I was a sophomore in college. So I transferred to University of Memphis. It was Memphis State at the time. And I worked full time and went to school and I got my degree in finance and I settled on finance because my dad always wanted me to be an engineer. I'm, I'm pretty adept at math, mm-hmm. but there was no way I could do that. I mean, that's just, just too confining for me. You the know? math? Yeah. Well, the math I could do, but just the, the confined space of where you'd be working and, and oh, what I you'd see. be doing. I see. I wanted more of a, of a creative mm-hmm. type of a, a you know, an inspiration that's creative and and creates a you know some exciting things for people so um i went to memphis state i graduated with a degree like i said in finance and then i worked in in the corporate world for international paper the world's largest paper company a fortune 50 company i had a really heady job i was very blessed to get it because it, they recruited from ivy league schools and here i was Hey, Memphis State, you know, I did a term paper on Elvis and I got an A, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, fine school, fine school. But, you know, so it was kind of intimidating, but God, it was a great job. I was a financial analyst. There were three people in my department and we were the three people that literally saw the earnings and sales at the close of every business month, mm. before even John George's, the CEO at the time, really? got to see those. And we were forbidden from trading stock. It was really, it was a great, heady job. And my boss was a, very much an advocate, very kind to me, and I learned so much from him. Mm-hmm. He gave me a lot of confidence, and he said, you'll be a mill controller by the time of 30 if you stick with this. But I, I just worked there a couple of years, and I said, you know... I really want to be in sales. I want to be out there with people. So I was blessed to get a job with a pharmaceutical sales company, which was a Fortune 100 company. I did that for a while. I loved it. Then I had my son and took a couple years off and went back into sales, uh, capital equipment sales for a while. So you're married at 21. How old are you when you have your child? 25. 25. So four years have gone by. So four years have gone by. That's right. Zachary, uh, Zachary Spencer Wines, my, my son, and he lives here in Huntsville. Um, so, you know, for me, I, cooking was always there for me. It was something I did all the time, despite mm-hmm. what my career was. And I knew I'd have a career in food one day. But, you know, you, you have to pay the bills. You have to follow your career at some point. And so I was really excited about being in the corporate world. I did very well. Um, and it it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about people, about finesse and talking to people and building relationships and yeah. all of that. And were in, you were you in your spare time like doing catering or I was just cooking up a storm. Just for your family? Just, just for my family. And then and to people, practice? Yes. And okay. people that knew me always wanted the food. So I would, you know, I'd have people that would uh I'd hand over some great stuff. They always and I do that in my neighborhood now and they're all, every time I do something, you know, they're like, okay, that dish, are we going to get some of that? And yeah. typically I, I do. I give my neighbors or my friends a lot of what I make. So. And, and how much like, so similar to a, uh, like a podcast host, right? Where right, I have right. A, I have a full-time job and this is something that, you know, you hope we're into episode 30 and, and hope it builds and, you yeah. know, who knows where it goes. Yes. Are you kind of having the same approach? Okay, I've got this great job. But mm-hmm. how many hours a week are you putting into your cooking and baking and, and other things just to see if, like, can I sustain this right. as a full-time gig? Right. And and can I do it? So how right. many hours a week were you doing Oh, that? gosh. Weekends all the time. Okay. Weekends all the time. And in the evenings, some, depending on what my schedule was in the corporate world. But I, you know, I was totally dedicated to it. I okay. knew that I would... 
So I you're was, really leaning into this. Yeah, I was really leaning into it, but I was, I was cautious because I knew, you know, my, I mean, my father told me, don't go in the food business. Okay. He, tr- he truly told me that. He said, you're an excellent cook. You know, do something else, but do not own a restaurant. You, you do not own a restaurant. So fast forward, corporate world, and then I decided, you know, I just got to do this. I got to jump off and do it. And I was married, and so I didn't have the pressure of having to produce an income right away, mm-hmm. which was a true gift. Mm-hmm. I went to a, a small culinary institute, Memphis Culinary Academy. It's defunct now, but it was a great, uh, just an introduction to professional cooking uh, certificate program. It's like four to six months, I think. Mm-hmm. Very intense with an incredible lead instructor. Uh, he was, he owned a, he lived and owned in a bakery in a bakery that his father owned. So he grew up there and he worked there from the time he could walk. So he was a master bread baker. Really? And he taught me so much about bread. That's why that's one of my fortes is bread because, because of that. So I went through that program. I started my first catering company, the European oven mm-hmm. to test the waters. Like you said, I mean, Josh, I had to know. What was, in, what was in front of me? And so I, I had that co- catering company for about a year and a half. And then I said, I've got to do a restaurant. I've, I know a vision of what I need to do, and I'm, and I'm going to do it. Okay. So that's where it started. And uh, who was your biggest supporter? Because your no, father, had your father, when did your father pass? He passed uh, six years ago. Okay. So he was a part of So he was in the picture. Mm-hmm. Did he become a supporter? Yes. Did he did He did in a reluctant way. It was so funny because eight months after opening, I was profitable, which is mm. really ex- extraordinary. And what was the name of the restaurant? Sweet. Sweet, Bist- Sweet Bistro. Sweet Bistro. Yeah. And it was first, it evolved. It was first called Sweet Dessertery, but no one knew what the hell a dessertery was. <laughs> Those were happening like in L.A. and New York. I was ahead of my time, or, or the concept was ahead of, mm-hmm. of its time at that point in Memphis. But so I changed it over to Sweet Bistro because people thought it was just going to be dessert. And what the restaurant was, is it, it was really marvelous. It was a dessert-centric restaurant, meaning all my desserts were made from fresh. They were phenomenal. When you walked in, I had a pastry ca- case with all the desserts. I had an espresso bar. You could take, you know, take your drink or, or sit down and work on your computer or whatever. And then I had savory food, a uh, full savory menu of food. A lot of bistro food, you know, paninis, fresh fries with truffle oil, uh, pastas, okay. and then gorgeous, just gorgeous desserts. And I also had a full bar, and I had a martini menu that became very successful. So after a year of being open, uh, the Memphis Magazine, which was really formidable at its time, they uh, there was a Memphis Reader's Poll every year. And first year, listen to this. This is like the juxtaposition of two <laughs> totally different worlds. I won for Reader's Poll for Best Dessert and then Best Martini Bar. Wow. So I was like jazzed about that because that was part of what I wanted is I want that celebratory environment in my restaurant and the, the we would do different things with martinis. We had martini specials all the time. I had a really great menu that was, you know, marketing is a lot of this, right? Mm-hmm. And so a lot of like the names of what I call these things were, it just meant something, you know, people wanted to try like Smurfs bathwater or, or, you know, some of the, the, the sweet, uh, at the effing sweet martini, mm-hmm. which was effing vodka, so I was just playing yeah. on that name. Yeah, lots of lots of different ones. I mean, um, just people were really interested in that. And then I would do we do like paint wine glasses on a Wednesday night, and and so you would be on it'd be on you would blow your it'd blow your mind to see like there'd be these big guys that would come yeah. in and they'd be doing like Sooners, you know, or whatever football game, and they got into it. Sure. It was really cool. And we would, we would display the martini bars in the back of the restaurant and people would vote on them. And, it, you know, it just kind of made it a, an involved so activity. Let me ask this. Mm-hmm. When, uh, just going back to when you were hatching the idea or more than that, yeah. what was the Memphis scene like? Was it devoid of the options you were going to provide or did you have some competition? 
was there a different another okay. martini bar? Because it seems like you kind of hitting them two prongs, right? You right. Have the, you're going to have the food side, right? Restaurant side, right? And some restaurants have a bar, and then yeah. and, um, some are better than others, right? But what was what did you feel was you're going to be your kind of competitive advantage? coming okay. into memphis okay because uh, it sounds like you were profitable within eight months yeah that was extraordinary and the thing about it was is i had to dial it down about being a deserter because people didn't understand that they didn't even know how to spell it right <laughs> i don't even know if i can now but the the thing about it was is that the the enthusiasm around it was what i what i looked for and there was no place in Memphis that was a dessert-centric restaurant that okay. offered what I did as far as, you know, a full bar and okay. then that dessert experience. And so I quickly became, the restaurant quickly became known as a great place to get, like I do chocolate fondue and eight different toppings, homemade toppings that you dip in the chocolate. I mean, we did some beautiful, beautiful stuff. Okay. And um, the other thing that we did that, I think was one of the best things that we did and people need to duplicate this is I loved making Southern buttermilk biscuits. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. I'm raised in Huntsville. My mm -hmm. mom made them every week and, and they were mighty fine still are. So what I did on Sunday for brunch is I cleared the bar of everything. And then I put like 12 different items in crock pots that you could put on your gray on the biscuits. So I'd deliver the biscuits to the table when the guests first arrived. And then they'd go up and just have fun. It'd be like drunken berries, different types of compound butters like maple nut butter, lemon butter, mm. um, uh, lime chive butter, chocolate fondue, uh, you know, candied bacon, uh, just all kinds of marvelous things for them. Anything you want you'd think of sausage gravy, red eye gravy. Turkey sausage gravy, you know, just, just anything you could think of. And it was a blast. People loved it. Was you, know? it you said it was only Sunday? Uh, it was my Sunday brunch. Sunday brunch. It was my Sunday brunch. And the commercial appeal, the, the prominent, this was, you know, back, this was in 2008. So the prominent magazine or, or newspaper at the time, they were very kind to me. And they said there should be a line around the block for Paula's Sunday mm, brunch. Really? Yeah. And it got to be that way. It, it did. So I did have a competitive advantage. It was, it was challenging because I was one of very few female restaurant owners. Okay. That was a challenge, but I, you know, I faced it head on. I, I learned not to be so nice because I was so overly nice that sometimes I got taken advantage of, mm. um, by my employees, but I, I quickly learned what I needed to do. And it was my place. It was my money. I owned it. I ran it. Yeah. I ran front of the house. I ran back of the house because I was on a shoestring budget trying to make this thing work, right? And so I, 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 I learned my voice, you know. I learned my voice about what it is I wanted to do, why it was important, and why I needed structure and people with me, my employees, that believed in it too. Okay. And I, I did get, I did get several employees that were, it was part of their mission to promote sweet. Yeah. They were wonderful, wonderful servers, wonderful bartenders. Um, I had to fire so many people and that's not a fun thing to do, but you know, the restaurant industry is tough mm -hmm. and you've, you've got to make sure you're on your game with the right people. And it was a hard thing to do, but it got to be where, you know, there were some incidents <laughs> that happened to me where, you know, firing was going to be the option and it was going to have to be the option like right away. You know, mm. I didn't have like a lot of Gordon Ramsay moments, but there were a couple of them. Really? You know, I kept under control. I mean, I didn't cuss anybody out, but uh, there was retribution if you really, really messed up, you mm. know, like no shows and sure. crazy stuff like that. Um, how long did you have the restaurant? Two and a half years. Okay. The second year in 2009, when the recession was really in full gear, all of a sudden my dining room wasn't full anymore. Mm. You know, it was like halfway full and it still did really, really well. But running a restaurant, you just think like my utility bill was $300, $3,000 a month. 
Really? Yeah. I mean, it's just the bills are insane, the insurance, et cetera, the food costs. I tried to work really smart with economies of scale with my food so I could cross over in different areas. Um, but it's a very expensive venture to do. A friend of mine told me he he's approached a lot of times, he's an investor, and he's approached a lot of times by people that say, hey, I've got these great recipes. I really want to open a restaurant. And he'll tell them mm. right at first, he'll say, you know what I think we need to do with that idea is, okay, here's a plate and here's a lighter. Now let's put about $500,000 on this plate and let's light it on fire. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> cold. I mean, he was cold, right? Yeah. But he was just trying to get them to understand this isn't, you know, like, Paula's little happy hour where we come in and make a couple things and see what happens. You know, this was, it was, it was recipe development. It was management of people. It was mixology. Yeah. I used to teach classes on mixology at the bar. You know, people come in, I would teach drinks. And so it was, you know, it was a heavy thing, but it was greatly supported. And I do truly believe this isn't just a line to, to, to stroke my ego or the restaurant's ego. Cause it's, about the restaurant, but I really was ahead of, ahead of my time. And a lot of people told me that they were like, they didn't, they didn't quite understand it, you know, but yeah. once they got in, they loved it. And, and it was such a, an incredible experience. I talk about like a plane taking off. So imagine dinner service. We did lunch and dinner and then Sunday brunch, but like dinner service. So we'd open at five people would slowly start to trickle in. And we had an outdoor patio, too. And it was like a production or a Broadway play every night. Mm. In that, the people would start to file in. All of a sudden, you'd start to hear the clinking of the glasses and the laughter Mm. and the plates and the laugh-out-loud laughter and the drinks being ordered and the appetizers being ordered. And it was a celebration. It's come to life. Yeah, it came to life. And there was nothing better. I used to stand at the back of the house with the door that led from the dining room into the back of the house. And I would just listen mm. to hear it. And, and it made me so, so happy that yeah. I was making people happy with my food. Yeah. That was my gig. So it was, I knew it. It was really... Actually, let me... Before I ask that question, let me ask you this question. Sure. I always struggle when a restaurant says things are homemade. I struggle with that. R- right. Um, how difficult is it to scale? Like you, like you were just saying with that person saying, hey, I got these recipes. Yeah, yeah. And I want to open a restaurant. Right. At some point... And please correct me if I'm wrong as sure. a restaurant owner or you have to figure out how to scale that. You know, if you start getting yeah. high demand, then it's not just the scale. Then it's also consistent quality. Right. Absolutely. That's and huge. Can you talk me through how difficult that is? And did, did okay. you experience that? And is it easy? How is it accurate to for someone to question homemade? Oh, yes. In a restaurant? Yes, it is. Because. Homemade now means, well, it was made in a home somewhere or in a factory somewhere. The, it's homemade almost with apostrophes around yeah. it, you know, or quotation marks around it. So, and and I, I'm sure there are many restaurants that do homemade, but, you know, my homemade tiramisu was homemade right there in the back. Or, you know, mm-hmm. my strawberry cake, it wasn't a gelatin-based strawberry cake. It was fresh strawberries, you know, you know just really elevated beautiful things and and a lot of my favorites were it, it was really neat to see what people demanded over and over again and right. and although people a lot of people don't like baklava baklava was my my jam too sure. and i it was superior and to this day it is and it's not me stroking myself on the back it's that you know i took 20 years to figure this out, this baklava out. It was, you know, it took a long time and I started in my teens. So it was, my dad handed me a box of phyllo dough and said, do something with this. Right. And I was like, oh, and I just ruined it. You know, I didn't know what to do with phyllo, how to manage it, all that. So that's a, that's a true art and science too. But yes, and economies of scale and food costs, they will kill you. Because you're not, you know, you're not running a business where you can have something on inventory on the shelf for several weeks mm-hmm. and switch it out and whatever. 
this stuff disappears quick. It spoils. Mm-hmm. So I had to look at my menu and utilize, like utilize my chicken for the paninis, for the pasta. Um, if I brought in, I, I did a, a, a nice, by you know, at that time it was a charcuterie board, but we didn't call it that. It was antipasti board. Mm-hmm. So I had to be real cognizant of the cheeses I used, how I could use those cheeses and other things. It's a real thought process. And for me, because I had never run a restaurant before, I had to I had to learn all of this stuff, and it, and it, it took a little bit of time, um, but but once I got in the groove, but it made st- sense. But so but at some point you had to teach someone on your staff, right? L- let's say that prior you you know your baklava is really popular, right? Well, now all of a sudden it's extremely popular. Yes, and now. You can't have your time and attention on creating every dish homemade. Right, right, right. right. So you have to, now from a quality perspective, Mm -hmm. you might be able to teach some people how to make the baklava. Right. But are they going to make it to the standard that you expect? Right. Or do you have to start saying, okay, I'm going to have to cut some corners here Mm -hmm. and make this more quickly. Yes, yes. And and get to the same result because I... We don't have time to put all of the homemade ingredients or factors into it because no. of the demand and the volume. Right, right, because of the volume. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So with my baklava, nobody made it but me. That was the okay. one thing nobody made. And I made everything and was able to, to teach people. I write the recipes and and show them and guide them through. And I'll tell you, the I had like I had a pastry person come in that had graduated from a very well-known prestigious uh, pastry and uh, chef's chef school, culinary school. Um, But she, she was wonderful, but the best baker that I ever had at sweet was my dishwasher. Really? And I'll tell you, I didn't know this at the time, but he walked three miles to work every day. Wow. I had no idea. And that's, a good, I, that's almost an hour. Yeah, oh, it was hour, ridiculous. Right? And you know, Memphis is not an easy town. Yeah. You know, it, it, it isn't. So I found that out and I made sure that I picked him up or somebody picked him up for the day so that he could that's that's insane. Sure. That's way that just just it blew my mind that commitment that he had. And he didn't even tell me. I just <laughs> I just found out about it. But I love to teach, and so I taught him about pastry and baking, and he loved it. And I told him, after we closed, I said, you need to get a gig doing this somewhere else. And I I think he did for a little while, but, you know, support is important. Encouragement is important. And so I, I just love being that force for people. And he was a damn good cook. Yeah. I mean, he just, I didn't have to worry because I knew he'd handle it. And he also would, he would help my other employees, you know, and, yeah. and, and, and crack, you know, crank out great, you know, dishwashing too at the same time, not at the same time, but intermittently. Sure. And, and, but I, I ended up hiring other dishwashers just so he could do his work. And that was great. That was one of the things I wanted to do mm-hmm. with the restaurant. And that kind of evolved into me teaching culinary at a later date. So that's essentially then to sum up your father's warnings. Oh. It's just it's just very involved, right? When you want to have a restaurant, it's right. very involved. And it's far more than just um, creating your passion right. regularly in, in, in food and drink. Right, it's, and it's, making it's, people happy through what you know. Because just, as, just when... You think things are great, and you find this dishwasher who can also is an ex, you know an excellent cook. Mm-hmm. Then they quit, they leave. Yeah, something happens, yes. and you have to you have to start all over again. Yes, absolutely. Which puts more pressure. Oh, it and does stress on you. It absolutely does. You you so I since I was the owner, the executive chef, the cook. Yeah. The you know, I was a terrible line cook, by the way. I I just I sucked at it. So if the it's um terrible. if the the um, recession, you know, and the market yeah. turn hadn't happened. Do you think you'd still been in business? Is that essentially what kind of drove you out? Yeah, I think they say uh, if you can pass the three or four year mark, you're going to be all right. Mm-hmm. You know, and then the 
the percentage of restaurants that fail in the first two years, it's a it's an astronomically awful percentage. It's right. so high, so high. But yeah, I, um, we got really good press. The food was wonderful. Um, the concept was really cool because the way I decorated it, you know, I decorated it. I, I went to um, thrift stores and got just mm. cool stuff. You know, I had no, no dish was the same as far as what it was served in. And um, yeah, it was just a really cool space. Um, somebody said, described it as part French bistro and part like grandma's kitchen. Mm. I wasn't crazy about the grandma's kitchen thing, but then I understood what she said. It was like, you, you feel at home and the food is very comfort food and, you know, elevated in its own way, but people loved it. And when I was, so getting back to my dad, when I was profitable at month eight, I called him and I said, dad, I'm profitable at, at month eight. I've mm-hmm. done it. And he just said, oh, okay. And I said, I said, uh, aren't you proud of me? I mean, I had to say it. I was like, aren't you proud? And he said, yeah, I really am. <laughs> but he still, <laughs> but he still didn't, didn't want me to do it or, or do it, handle all that responsibility because with all of the roles, I, I was there all the time. I installed a shower in my actual office because you know, I would, and I had couches there and everything for people to sit on coffee tables. It was really a great environment, very mm-hmm. great environment. Um, but I would, I would, when I got done from work, it was usually very, very late at night. And anyone who runs a restaurant will tell you after evening service, you're just ramped up. Yeah. You're just not ready to go to sleep. You know, you just, yeah. you're just not. And so, I would, my service and I, we'd have a cocktail at the end, you know, and I'd let them have, you know, let them have a meal, of course, there, because I wanted it to be about them, too. Mm -hmm. They needed to buy into it for it to be a success and for us to be able to create some synergy and really make this happen. But, you know, I I can remember um, one of, like, walking down my rest, the back of the house of my restaurant with hair dye on my head. (laughs) dyeing my hair while I was walking around making sure everybody was okay you know just just live there and then dogs are a very important part of my life and they have been forever Mm -hmm. and so I had two dachshunds at home and like Sunday after brunch when everything was cleaned up I'd go get my dogs and I'd let them you know run around a little bit and of course they didn't get in the kitchen but um They'd sit on the couch with me and we'd watch television and, you know, because I needed to be there. And I just felt bad about how much my dogs were were being neglected. I just, yeah. you know, and I would take breaks to go home and check on them, too. So because I was there, you know, mm-hmm. 80 to 100 hours a week. So let's transition. Mm-hmm. How So you close a restaurant. Yes. You stay in Memphis or do you come back to Huntsville? I stay in Memphis and it was a sheer blessing and miracle a culinary school Le Col culinaire opened in memphis right after my restaurant closed and so i interviewed with them and i was on staff with them as a culinary instructor now this is the interesting thing about that so because i had a business degree and not all chefs do and mm-hmm. and other chefs have much more culinary training than i do you know we all have our space um, they hired me to teach the business aspect of the, this was a, this was an associate's degree program in culinary mm-hmm. and you had to learn how to market yourself. You had to learn how to speak in front of people. You had to learn what, uh, you know, what marketing is, what economies of scale are, all of those, all those business things that you needed to learn. And that was, you know, that was in a very involved process to do that. Very involved. And how... How soon after you closed did you land that job? Oh, man. It was like within, it was less than a year. It was like okay. six months. And then I also, I was also a chef. So I didn't do a lot of chef instruction, but I did some. I created, we had a, um, we had a, a restaurant associated with 
the culinary school. So people from the public could come in mm. and the students would create the recipes. It was fabulous. Gotcha. And so I, I created and ran their very first breakfast service. I, I gave them some recipes from Sweet for them to utilize mm-hmm. and, uh, and saw that be implemented. So that was a, that was a lot of fun. And cool. then my students just, I loved my students so much. And one thing I used to say to them is, who you are is enough. And I still get students today that will text me or message me and say, hey, chef, just remember who you are is enough. And I'm like, mm-hmm. damn straight it is. Cool. You know, you remember that too. And it, it affected them because a lot of them had never been in food. A lot of them were intimidated. A lot of them were young. A lot of them were older. So I had a mixed bag of people and they all had their own desire to do this, but they had their own insecurities about mm-hmm. it. And I was there to just make sure that, you know, that they grew. Okay. And it was wonderful. So was was Sweet the only restaurant you ever owned? Yes. Okay. I owned two catering companies, but Sweet was the only restaurant that I owned. Catering after Sweet? One before and one after. Okay. Yeah, one after. And then so after, so I, I also... With the culinary, once once Sweet closed down, and then after I did the culinary instruction, I got back into sales because it was so lucrative. Mm. And quite frankly, food was, sales. No, no, and in, in in medical sales. Oh wow! So so my two pillars of my career have been food, and then corporate sales, okay. you know, pharmaceutical sales, Fortune yeah. one hundred. I mean, I worked for some amazing companies, Abbott, Smith Klein Pharmaceuticals, uh, just so many yeah. highbrow companies that really they benefited from. I benefited from learning from them, top no, top notch learning in so many ways that I carried on even in my food career. You know, believe it or not, and. Were you it selling was fun to, to like, be good at. Were you selling to individual practices? Uh-huh, I was fe- selling okay. to physicians, right. to other healthcare professionals, to hospitals. Uh, it was it was a great it was a great gig, but it was not my it was not my heart. But it was, you know, it was my gig yeah. that really brought income in, so that I could do other things. So my my wife Wendy's now in the studio. Hello. Hi, Wendy. And, uh, I was Hi, Wendy. T- when we first got married, I worked for my brother in law okay. in Washington D.C. in a medical practice oh you did we had four internal physicians two Mm -hmm. specialized in geriatrics a cardiologist uh wow we had a we had a whole lab you know some phlebotomists oh my gosh wow and they had some x-ray tech and all this stuff right and the thing that we all loved Mm -hmm. was it was typically on fridays (laughs) sometimes a thursday i know what you're gonna say the medical salespeople, the um, pharmaceutical reps and such would come in Oh yeah, which meant free lunch. Oh yeah, and uh, I mean, th- and we would beg, hey, hey, uh, Doctor League, do you think you could get that medical rep to come back? Yes, yes. They brought, you know, whatever. Oh, and great stuff. We had to be in. So did you? Did you? I'm just had this thought to come to my mind. Did you um, ever prepare your own food? Well, I I because I would imagine you you catered right to yes those yes. you're selling to and brought food and lunch for the staff well yes i did but i purchased the food because i just didn't have the time to create all those dishes yeah, and sure. bring them in and 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 you know it's expensive to oh, do sure. all of that but i always did my baklava for my physicians and okay. i swear that's one reason why i got president's club one year i, I knew like it top 10 percent. they're like damn that baklava is fine i knew you know? see i was angling i knew you must have done something like oh yeah that, right to bring yeah another part of your life and career and passion yeah into the medical they knew, sales field. yeah they knew it and then good for you it, yeah I, i've i've shipped my baklava to different states was now now was that in memphis as well were you doing medical sales Mm -hmm. okay in memphis yeah i did all right so let's uh let's transition to you come to huntsville yes how how many years ago was that that you came back i came to huntsville in 2014 i believe my mother had passed away but my family is all here except for my sister my two brothers are here my parents were here my sister is in mcdonough georgia and my my mother had passed away young she was 66. My dad was 15 years older. And there's a great story. If we get time, we can talk about that. But my dad was in his 80s, and I was very close to him. Um, 
and so I moved to Huntsville to be close to him. Okay. I was divorced, and I was able to, to come to Huntsville. So when I got to Huntsville, the first job I got was back in medical sales again. Okay. Right? In healthcare sales. And I did that for a while, and then I had the opportunity to do Paula Cuisine. That's what I did right before I started my vlog and my content creation. And it was artisan desserts, small batch, and I'd sold those to individuals. And it, it, it was great, but my, my thing is I don't rush what I do. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd, I'd rather do one fine dish than do five that are subpar. So, you know, like lasagna where I, my, my sauces were from scratch and, you know, mm -hmm. all the love that you put into that. And my bread was freshly made challah bread that I, you know, put together. And so, you know, it's, it, I couldn't do all that and do the, you know, and do the medical side of it. So it was nice for me to finally say, okay, I'm, I'm drawing a line, this line in the sand and this is where I am now. And it's about food. Okay. And then naturally it, it just evolved because some of the things that I've done in my background too, I've had a great career. I, I was a professional model in my thirties, believe it or not, with an agency. I don't in, believe it. I know. I know. Can you believe I do that now and I'm almost 60? No, I've seen the picture. What's wrong with me? I, no, nothing's wrong with well, you. Well, my editing, I'm, my photographer, I'm like, stop taking all those wrinkles out because people are going to look at me and they're going to be like, okay, that's you? <laughs> so we're trying, you know, I'm trying to, I mean, I'm owning my age. I love modeling. I love the camera. It's fun. I love the creative aspect of it. Yeah. So, so I, I, you know, I've done some really cool things in my career. That's one of the other things I've done. And um, real quick, as a family, yeah. as a family joke, yeah, one of my me. kids stopped me in my tracks once. I think it was Jason. He's our third. Well, he's our third child and our yeah. second boy. He looks at his wife as he says that. Our second youngest. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out how to like phrase it. I've talked about him before. Yeah. But I, I said something like, you know, what's wrong with you? He says, I don't know. The doctors haven't told me yet. Oh, you know? I love that. Yeah. And I was like, now that's a clever that's, response. Yeah, that's pretty That's yeah. pretty awesome, actually. Who, so taught, who taught him to be that quick-witted? Well, it's probably my genes. I don't know. You think so? <laughs> it may be a half-and-half half thing, or it could just be your wife over here. I said, well, that's a, that's a good one. Yeah. I like that. Uh, yeah, see? He knows his power. I don't know where he um, like picked that up. That's but. great. And that you know, it takes a lot of intelligence to be humorous and to sure. speak off the cuff it so really let's does. um let me ask you well let's we're gonna probably start going through your pictures here soon that you sent but okay. who were some of the other influencers that you've gravitated towards since being here in huntsville well so or from, okay or you know maybe they look up to you yeah um and you're you're helping those that are aspiring to get to you know right your level or right or those that you've partnered with, or at least share ideas with. Yes. Well, there was a there's a um, company actually in India that I was um, working with and and advising them on their business. They they're they're yogi centered company. They have just a, a full line of yogi uh, food and snacks. For, you know, for people who are about that lifestyle and it's vegetarian. Mm -hmm. And so I, I talked with him a little bit about how he needs to focus both his marketing and things that he can do with his food. So that was exciting. I did that last year. And then, you know, now I'm beginning to collaborate with different businesses um, with my, I have a, um, an interview series on YouTube called at the table with Paula. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to partner with restaurants to promote them and then also, more importantly, really, is to promote the people that work there or people that are not in the industry. That's part mm. of my focus Focus with that. So okay. I've, you know, like last week, um, I, I, well, I did uh, a broadcast at The Bottle here in downtown Huntsville. Fabulous mainstay restaurant mm -hmm. here. And I was happy that we got a lot of traction on that. And it was because of who I interviewed and you know, what we showed what he did, how he mixed drinks, et cetera. So That's I'm cool. continuously now, especially now that I'm gaining traction, looking for sponsorship opportunities and a couple have come my way. And one, I'm praying, I'm not going to say who it is because I'm praying that it's going to hit. Yeah, sure. Yeah, come on now. Let's do it. So, <laughs> you know, so it's it's that. And then 
I really, um, Thomas Keller of French laundry, laundry fame, I've said this before, to me, he is an inspiration because of his ethos about cooking. Mm. Like he, he's very humble. He's very kind of subdued, you know, quiet in his own world, but a master, um, you know, that, that machine in his head is working all the time. And what I love most about him is his humility in saying, he literally said this one time, he said he, he was, he was, um, he was deconstructing a rabbit for a, for a, a, a dish. And he said, you know, I always take a second in my mind and I think about this rabbit and I think about this rabbit had a life. Oh, wow. It doesn't anymore. I mean, this is rare for some chefs to say. Yeah. They're like, let's just, let's see it slaughtered. You know, it's okay. <laughs> I mean, not everybody, but you know, some are just, they're not vegetarians. They don't, you know, whatever. And he's not, but he has a profound respect for the ingredients of food, yeah. especially those that we that we utilize, sure. you know, and I just I thought that was amazing that he would, as famous as he is, that he would take that moment and do that. It's on video somewhere. Cool, but yeah, and I've never been to the French Laundry. It's on my bucket list. And Bouchon is he has Bouchon, which is his his kind of bistro restaurants, and they they are fabulous too. So they're they're all over. And then he's in Vegas, I think. Mm-hmm. But yeah, he was he was a big pivotal influence for me, and always has been. Cool. And and I really am so excited about the Huntsville community and the female influence in food that is happening. Yeah. I was approached when I first started the content creation a couple years ago by a CEO here and he said, "You know, what you're doing, you need to get out and meet with other females that are making things happen." Uh, like Stephanie Kennedy, Kennedy Mel with Church Street, their tr- Church Street family of restaurants, and so we we kind of played phone tag, etc. Um, but then we finally were able to establish a restaurant, and it's been wonderful to be able to get to know her and all of the offerings that she has. She has a heady position to to handle all of that. They've got a lot of great help, but you know I want to support businesses. Yeah. I, I want to support people that really know what it's like to struggle. You know, these independent restaurants, it's just a total, it's an act of love, and there's a lot of thankless days. Yeah. So I'm here to, that's one of the things I want to do is be an ambassador for Huntsville. Yeah. And all of these fabulous businesses that are that are coming up and get to know the people. And it doesn't have to be about a restaurant. Like my At the Table series, we're going to start filming in my home. And I'm t- just going to talk to some really influential people like you're doing. I'd love to have you on, by the way. You're going to have to show up for that. We'll talk we'll about that We'll get to do the, uh, the backyard cooking segment because that's my job. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We got to do that. On your flat iron. Oh, I've got a griddle, a smoker, a grill. You name it. Oh, my God. Yeah. We talked a little bit to me yeah. about that. You're, yeah. You've, my Memphis. You've got some prowess. In I've you. got a Memphis style bologna. And I've got to give all the credit to a fellow that, God rest his soul, his name was Shotgun Red. Oh. On YouTube. Oh my God! And he uh, he has a Memphis style, uh, not fried, but bologna sandwich. Yeah, is it grilled uh, on a tr- on a? Yeah, top? I mean, you smoke it for three three and a half hours. Oh, you smoke it. First. And then on the at the end, it's a reverse sear. You um, then you oh. slice it up and then you sear it. Oh my God, that's um, fantastic! But it's the barbecue sauce that really that it. he has it. And I'm not gonna share no it. no. I mean, don't. well, I shouldn't say it's this, it's on YouTube. No, but you but, need um, to own There's a barbecue what you sauce have. that takes three days to make. Okay, that must be fabulous. And um, it is the flavor melding on something like that. You know, barbecue's interesting because I'm I'm not a huge fan of the North Carolina style of vinegar. Okay, yeah, I, I the vinegar. I right, I don't like it's too much totally vinegar. different. And mm-hmm. everyone's different that way with barbecue. Right, right. But I'm telling you, from my palate, mm-hmm. that is the best barbecue sauce I've ever had. And the eat the secret ingredient is. Anchovies. I knew you were going to say three that. anchovies, okay. and you you blend the anchovies with Rotel, and that's with Rotel with a, a fifteen ounce can of Rotel, and then everything else gets added. But you blend those together, and oh, he he made a point to say not four anchovies, not two, three. three. 
Yeah. Like he had, he had experimented. Yeah. He had, he knew how much of that fish flavor would add a nuance that people don't, people don't recognize the nuance of anchovies. You know, they're like, ah. And then I would, I I think I spent two hours on the saucepan, like, you know, simmering it and stirring it. Oh my gosh. And then it goes in the fridge for three days. It has to be absolutely phenomenal. That that flavor development, there's no way. Time is such a, a good friend and, and a then, requirement of, of many sauces. You know, and similar to like a pulled pork sandwich, you have the Memphis style he had, had like a coleslaw. It did, okay. Which is fine. So barbecue slaw, coleslaw, and the bologna. But did I also it? like just lettuce and cheese and tomato and, yeah. and going that route too. Yeah. So did, I did, did it have pickles on it? I didn't, I mean, I could have. I love pickles on barbecue. I don't eat pork anymore, but I'm not a vegetarian. I just don't eat pork, but... So we'll talk Man, about I that love... on, on my episode on your show. Okay, that's great. Let's and do that. And some it. other things that I specialize All right, I'm, in. I'm taking notes. Good. Um, <laughs> so let's, uh, I'm going to make a comment. Okay. I think I'm going to make a comment. And then we're going to switch over to, uh, I have a new and improved way that I can just go to what I call the internet oh. or to the to the footage that I have prepared for a guest. Oh, nice. So okay. people used to see me have to reach over and, and touch a button and all that. But because I'm a one-man band... I now have a way that it's it's simply that fast. Wow. And so... You've got it down now. Yeah. That's fabulous that you can do that. All right, so let's start rolling through some of these shots. Okay. Um, this is, again, kind of, kind of a showcase episode. We're going to go through a lot of pictures here. Okay. This will create conversation. These are not meant that we're going to spend a short amount of time or long amount of time. Sure. We'll spend a, a, whatever appropriate amount of time on okay. each one. Okay. So just this is a class. Mm-hmm. This is here in Huntsville. Yes. So tell me about this class. So this is a class I recently did with a small group of people that have been really great supporters of mine. It's in my home, and I was teaching the focaccia garden art. Okay. So making, you know, making the focaccia bread, and then what you see here is all of the different herbs and vegetables and low moisture fruits that you decorate on this bread. And it's aesthetically beautiful, but it's also must be delicious. Mm-hmm. So when we had one, one of the the classmates that I had there, my student, she was gluten free, and I was like, "Oh man, I don't know how to make gluten free focaccia. I got to figure this out." So yeah, yeah. I so I did. You know, I mean, I want everybody to have a great experience. So we we you know they they, they created beautiful boards. Everybody's always intimidated intimidated at the beginning and then they just figure out their groove and they they love it so that's that's the most recent class that i've done so i think we see that bread on the table and i think you're going to do a close-up here shortly yeah this is one of my what one of my students created okay there's several close-ups of my focaccias through the through our pictures too all right so what are we looking at here so this is my lovely lemon icebox pie it's uh it's really something else um what I love about it is I use eight egg yolks in this thing, and so it's almost like a mousse. Mm. It's light but rich at the same time, which is an important thing, I think, to me. You know, you can be too rich. You have to have some part of that that food experience that lightens it up, too. Mm-hmm. Your palate deserves all of those things, you know, texture, flavor. Um, and so this is a really nice recipe. What, what else is in there's any other like secret ingredients or something you've learned with lemon pie just no just uh, lots of eggs and okay. lots of whipping time and you can't rush something like this recipe and and these recipes are all on my website i have for a, people to look at i have a great waffle recipe and one of the great oh. things that lightens it up is separating the yolk Yes. From the white yes. and then and then whipping that white to like a meringue. Yes. And then folding it back in. Right. Right. It makes Absolutely. It, it's, it's so good. Yeah. It, it takes time to do it and I don't always do it. Right. But when we do, yeah. oh man, it's so uh, good. Right. And that's 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 kind of the foundation for a moose too. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's lovely. That's Ricky HSV, correct? Ricky HSV at the table with Paula drinking a couple martinis. Life is good. <laughs> and that, I can't tell if that cameraman... It's yeah, in the, he's in the back. If he's in the back or he's like Tyler. a mirror. But. He's, yeah, he's in the back just giving a shout out. But yeah, so that's my At the Table series. And I do go to restaurants to promote them. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I'm going to do a lot of them in my home too. So because of what you said, it's 
it's a difficult setup. You know, you got to make sure you're at the right time for them. You don't want to infringe upon their mm-hmm. business, but you want to promote their business. So I'm definitely a part of that. And that's happening. I have a, a I now have a full time videographer photographer. So a lot of my content is now really being leveled up because I don't have to do every single thing. I yeah. still have to do like 98% of it. I still do all the dishes. I still do all the shopping. I still do, you know, I, I still do all the creating and it's, yeah. you know, it's it, content creation is, it's a tough gig, Sure, you know, and it's been cool to see how I've been able to progress in the last couple of years with that. But it's, it, you know, you know, it's all it's it's a lot of work to like just to get to a, a picture of a recipe. Yeah. You know, it's not somebody else's that I'm taking. It's it's what I create. And, uh, and just, I love that. I want to tie together two things. One, you mentioned earlier, just as your restaurant would kind of wake up, yeah. right? You open for business and little by little people come in, the noise gets louder, you yes. hear more clanking and right. of the dishes. Mm-hmm. And I used to interview football players at a local sports bar. He was, oh, great! He was one of my sponsors, and I would interview. I would interview the coaches every week. Okay. So I would have content for the game that I was gonna. I love it. I was gonna do play by play for you know on that Friday. Sure. And it would add to the game script and the game content. But uh, I would interview the captains before the season, and then I would interview some of the players like during the season. Nice. Just as a way to hopefully get more of the kids to come in and sure. eat wings and, yeah. and bring their families, but Great. but also give them an opportunity if they were going to go on to play in college. This was really going to be their first kind of on camera experience getting interviewed, I s- right? I see. And so, but okay. I would show up at the restaurant, and it was a lot of work to set up, and mm-hmm. and I had to be out of the way. Yes, right, because yeah. they're a place of business, and yes, they right. want me there, but I have to not take up even one tables. No. Worth, worth of space because that's lost revenue. It is, yes. But it was there was nothing better than once you're all set up and you're sitting down and then you put the headphones on mm-hmm. and you hear all of that hustle and bustle of, oh. the, of, of the restaurant, right? And I had an external right. mic where I would... I would turn it up so you could hear that. I love that you did and, that. Um, that is part of the experience. Yeah, and there's that is a um, a unique experience when you can kind of broadcast in a setting like that around just the public doing their doing their thing. doing their thing. And, you know, ninety percent of the people don't even they forget you're even there. Right. 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 But yeah. uh, but it it always I just loved being kind of you know intermixed. Yeah, intermixed into, in, a, into, into the vibe, a restaurant vibe. Yeah, in, in, yeah, into what they're doing. And, and yeah, I, that's why I'll, I'll always do that because I want to showcase restaurants. Now, this is a focaccia bread? Mm-hmm. This is one of this is one of my Mardi Gras focaccia creations. So you can see the masks. Um, and then there should be a picture of once it's done. So, yeah. you know, I, what I've used is peppers in different ways and radicchio is in there in the top corner. Um, I've even used peas, uh, lots of dill, um, red mm-hmm. onions. You know, like I said, it's got to be beautiful, but it also has to taste magnificent. Yeah. So, I like this one right, with the red onions or the eyes. Yeah. And yeah. Isn't that funny? you got the peppers, the nose. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's good stuff. I know. The little, the little um, tuft. Yeah. And the, so these are focaccia rolls, and they are fabulous, and aren't they pretty to look at? Mm-hmm. They are made with edible pansies from my garden. Pansies are edible, and they are great to decorate with. Mm. They're just, and, and they actually have a, like a mild, very mild, slightly like very slightly um, kind of a astringent really? give to them. But the, the rolls, just they're just a focaccia recipe that I've made into rolls. And like I said, all this is on my website. Um, but wanted to come up, you know, I'm just trying to come up with different ways mm-hmm. that it's fresh, you know, that good, it looks fresh. Good response to those? Oh, yeah. Yeah, my focaccia garden, I ended up starting a... Instagram just for that. And then I was spending, I'm spending so much time on my Paula Nam Chef mm-hmm. Instagram that I'm posting more on there. And now more people are following me on the, just the focaccia garden. So I'm having to double back and make sure I post there too, because I've kind of neglected that. Do people, I forgot to, I was going to kick off the show mentioning just your last name, your surname mm-hmm. of Nam Chef. Yeah. Do people think that if they don't know you, that you just kind of created that because oh. you're a foodie? And then you have to tell them, no, that's actually my given Macedonian yes. 
name. Yes, I had surname all the time. I mean, people say like, "Oh, chef like chef." Like I had a restaurant, I had I had one guy. He'd had a couple drinks, enjoying himself, and he he grabbed my arm as I walked by, and he said, "Nom chef." So chef like chef, right? And I said, "Well, yeah, kind of." <laughs> <laughs> so they always people throw that in they do it's just kind of an ironic thing all right it'd so be really cool if there was just one f that's true well i guess you could i could change uh, you it could but change it if you my, want to. my father would be mad and my grandfather would roll over in his grave so i i'm gonna keep it as hard as it is to spell and as I, many times as people butcher my name it was not fun in high school having that name i'll tell you that oh really yeah yeah People are just mean. They're mean, yeah. And and then, you know, I always knew when they came to my name, the instructor would be like, not un chef. They just say, yeah. you get it. Yeah. All right, so you were featured in the Huntsville Magazine. Yeah, just this fall issue. This I is... was so grateful. And um, so tell me about the article they wrote on you. Yeah, so uh, they contacted me um, and wanted to showcase me as a food and lifestyle influencer here mm -hmm. in Huntsville. And uh, they had seen a lot of my work, and they they featured twenty people, micro or macro influencers, which I really respected mm -hmm. that. And they talked about uh, the feature. Just talks about what I do with food, uh, the interview series, and how I have fun with fashion, with the modeling, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and I've gotten tremendous response from it, and I it, consider it. A great honor to be featured. Absolutely. Really a great honor. There's my sister. Oh, so here comes the bread. Yes. That's Isn't that done. something beautiful? Ooh, and it tastes so good. So you the, the And those faces, the masks really kind of come to life more too. And they do. They do. I mean, you really that's the other thing about focaccia art that makes it kind of a delicate thing to understand is that like, for instance, the herbs, they have to be soaked in lemon water mm -hmm. and dried well before you put them on the focaccia to bake because they'll brown. And then different vegetables and fruits, I have to experiment with them for that point that you just made to see what they're going to look like when they're baked. Mm. I, did a, um, I did a focaccia board that, uh, or focaccia bread that was a mushroom tree, mm -hmm. and it looked really cool, you know, when I built it. But when I baked it, it was horrendous. Really? It just like like brown dots all over the place. It was terrible. So I was like, okay, that's not going to be published. So if, if you were to make that for me mm -hmm. and I wanted to buy it from you, what would the price tag be on this? Probably uh, easy 50 to $75, which is really cheap considering it's you know homemade dough and mm -hmm. all that. But yeah. You get about 10 to, to 12 servings out of that? Oh uh, yeah, I would say I'd say probably ten, eight to ten. Eight to ten. Yeah, it's a long board. It's a it's a half size sheet pan that that's on. So, yeah, you may get twelve actually. Oh, and there's my challah bread. I mean, is that not just the sexiest thing you've ever that seen? That looks really good. Yeah, I just I I've mean, seen I sexier just, things than that. Well, but this is true. But we're not. We won't go. It on might that be in route. the top twenty. Oh, okay. Um, for bread? Okay. I doubt that. Well, yeah, no. you are kidding. Bread but, isn't a top three. Uh, yeah, okay. So I, I'll need to make you some focaccia. That's, and I've taught that too, and I'm going to teach that again. Um, I'm currently looking at public places that I can teach mm -hmm. because I, in my home, I'm so limited with how many I can have. So just stay tuned to find out more about where I'm going to be teaching in Huntsville. And this is just a... Uh, yeah, a that's little the bio little bio. Uh huh. Yeah, that was very nice of them to to this, do that for oh, me. Oh, so this was in the magazine. I now I realize yes. I could have moved these around a little bit better. No, that's cool. No, that that was the actual magazine. That's the little blurb that they gave on me. So this was you amongst, and there were twenty there other were folks 20. featured in the, yes, the magazine, all with great merits, uh, great work that they're doing in Huntsville to promote the city. Okay. I just it's really, you know, Troy. It's really very poignant and exciting for me to be back in the city of my birth mm -hmm. where, you know, I was born and raised and my father had so much to do with NASA. Like so many of us, we watched the city grow early in the seventies and the eighties. I left, I come back and this exponential explosion of our city mm -hmm. with, with all of the fine things and the fine minds and fine places 
it's wonderful to be a part of this yeah. and to help support it and grow the efforts of everybody because the quality here of, of what's happening is amazing. It yeah, is. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. I, I often wonder what my dad and mom would say about it. My mom would be like, well, I don't like that traffic. <laughs> I, I don't like it. But, and, but my dad would, he'd be like, yeah, I like this. This is really, this is a good re- rena- a renaissance of where we were. Let's take it up another level. Yeah. I, it feels like we're just kind of firing on all cylinders here. We are. In Huntsville. We are. And, and I love the, in the Our Town podcast, having guests who represent just so many elements of industry. Yeah, right? absolutely. That's what I wanted. That's what I do too with mine. I think mm-hmm. it's really important. You know, the mission here is to get to know people, mm-hmm. you know, because we, we know them through like just cursory interviews or bios or whatever, but I really want to get to know the real person, you sure. know, and, and what they're all about so that people can learn things that they didn't know about that person, you know, and make it interesting. Now, this is your... That's my chef garb. That's your chef garb. Yeah, it has your name my, on it. That's my arms crossed in full chef mode. Okay. <laughs> Serious look on your face. Yeah, yeah. That's usually the way way it is. Now, oh. what is going on with this? <laughs> so this was a Halloween shoot that we just did. Because we just, I just love to create images. And I'll tell you what. I had so much makeup on, and um, I just have to thank my makeup artist um, from Mac. She did uh, an amazing job. Her name is Ayana, and she works at Ulta Mm -hmm. doing makeup, but then she also is a professional on her own. What she did was was really, really amazing to make me look like that. And then, of course, I have a a wig on. Um, We had... We had, I bought a smoke machine from yeah. Home Depot <laughs> to run in there. And Is this I, your front door? Yes. Okay. But the smoke machine, think about this, okay? The smoke machine was in front of me, throwing oh, all really? that smoke back. And I told the photographer, I said, look, okay, we'll do this, but I got some nice furniture and some nice art, so what do I need to cover? He said, just cover your TV. Everything else will be right, well, okay. It's it's for indoor use. Yeah. But, you know, he'd fire that thing up every 10 minutes, and I was just thinking, oh, God, please. And then you're using please. some sort of light in there yes, to he's, create he's, the purple effect. Yes, like these lights that you have here. Yeah, my RGB filters. Yeah, he had uh, a larger one that had different colors that we ran through. Um, but this, and, and we did a couple video clips of me kind of teasing people saying, I'm out here serving these to your kids. <laughs> well, I was just about to, I wonder if you had 50 kids come up to your door and you yeah. answered like that, how many yeah. are going to run away? Like, just cause it's like, Oh, not that it's bad. It's no, just, it's a little scary. It's a startling. Yeah. And it's supposed to be, you yeah. know, that's what we want. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, very, probably, very creative. Yeah. Well, my photographer, Mark Shelton is amazing at uh, coming up with concepts. I mean, I, we came up with a concept together and then those are actually my pumpkin cupcakes. Mm. The recipe is on the website and what makes them different is, you know, those hostess cupcakes, the chocolate ones with mm-hmm. the cream filling oh, inside. Of course. Yeah. So what these are, and they don't look like it there, but they are a mimic of that old fashioned cupcake, pumpkin, fresh pumpkin cake with a whipped cream in the side and the inside of it, covered with a ganache, and then the little swirlies, the white swirlies that you would always see, you know, on the top of, of those cupcakes. So they're they're good. They're good. I'm just amazed. They're leveled up, baby. I can certainly appreciate the time for everything in this shot. Oh so my god. The time for you to make the just to make the cupcakes. Oh. The time on the makeup. Yeah. The time to set up, you know, the the smoke machine and right. the lighting. Get the That's, wardrobe right. Buy you buy what I need to buy. It's an incredible amount of effort. It, it is. And it's well done. The just the dishes alone I'm like, can I get a dishwasher sometime? <laughs> That's on my bucket list. So tell me about this this picture. Uh, so this is Danny Davis from Tangled String Guitars. Everybody knows about him. And I did an at-the-table interview at his studio about six months ago. And so this is this this at-the-table series is now going to be twice a month. Now that I have dedicated help that I need, we've already scheduled six of them out. So you'll see they'll be on my YouTube channel, and there's 
two dedicated every single month. Okay. Really interesting people. I have a lineup of some great people and a couple of them, I pr- approached them and I, I said, take a look at that the series. It's just really started. Um, and let me know if you want to be on. And I've had some really formidable people say, yeah, I'd love it. That's so I'm awesome. like, okay, that's cool. I'm, it makes me happy that they, they want to join in. Now, there's quite the contrast between the Paula we see here and the Paula <laughs> yeah. we see there. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's called makeup and acting. Yeah, there you go. I used to act too in Memphis. So that was, it was, that was, I bring all that back and I love, I just love creating in front of the camera. It's just a lot of fun. So what, are, what dessert cake are we looking oh, at here? Oh, y'all need to go to my website for this one. This is a beauty. This is a brie cheese frosted fresh pear cake. So it's made with fresh pears in the cake. Uh-huh. It's, it's fabulous. And then it has brie cheese whipped into the frosting. And then it has and you walnuts. Got about four layers of frosting, right? Four layers of frosting. And then it's got walnuts on the top for crunch. You can leave that out. And then you can see there's drizzle yep. on the side of the cake. Uh, Is that it, a pear drizzle? It's a it's a um, it's a pear like reduction drizzle. Okay. So kind of a simple syrup, thinner that way, but with the essence of pear. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. And you know, it's funny starting out, you know, you create something that really is worthy of some attention Uh and you get 10 likes and you're like, Oh man, I know it's hard. (laughs) Dang it. But, but I'm getting there, you know, I'm getting there. I know my work is good. And I, and and if you, if you just keep at it, you know, you just have to keep at it and you've got to be strong and persevere. And, and I have, I I mean, as we've been talking, mm-hmm. there's probably been 200 million TikTok posts. Right. right? So there's right, just people it. in a constant barrage of, of create, you know, somebody yeah. wants their attention towards whatever right. it is, right? And right. We're, we're just mixed into that. We are. That ocean of content out it there. Is, it but is. But like you said, the best stuff will percolate to the top. Yeah, I'm right? hoping so. And now that I have uh, for my food, which I'll do at least two a month. Real inventive food posts with the recipes. Um, there will be at least two of those a month too, and they will go on my website and Instagram, etc. That's a focaccia bread right there that we've cut and just served as an appetizer one night. There's one that's in a, a skillet, and it has different peppers and onions. You know, they don't have to all be extraordinary mm-hmm. lab. But oh, there's some shoes. Ooh, we're going to talk about the shoes or we're well, going to wait? Let me, let's look at this picture here. Okay. Well, those are on the slideshow. Yes. So it's harder for me to isolate. I can't stop that. Okay. But this yeah. is a picture of you. So it's, uh, yes. tell us about that. It's hard. It's kind of hard to see, but you're definitely wearing a headpiece. Yes. Oh, an exquisite headpiece from a defunct store named Pazitz from the 1970s. Pazitz. Pazitz department store. Anyone who's lived here for a long time knows about Pazitz. This is, so this is a beautiful artisan headpiece. It actually has feathers and it looks like little birds. It's so pretty. And this was a photo shoot I did for event magazine about three months ago, I guess. Really? That was, that was terrific. We, We had a great time doing some work with them. I'm trying to make sure that this headpiece. Yeah. It's so pretty. If you can get to it, I can't, that's all right. You can kind of see. Uh, yeah. It was a lot of fun. And that's on my front porch. You know, just whatever. <laughs> and the, you know, your shoes. Mm-hmm. So you've got a black, is that black, the headpiece? Yes. And then you're wearing kind of a navy. No, that's black. It's a that's black jumpsuit. Okay, mm-hmm. it's just my, my screen. With a big, nice bow on top of it, you okay. know, on the chest area. And then your your um, shoes. My Gucci boots. Your Gucci boots. My roach stompers. Those are what color? Because they're one, black. They are black. They're fabric and also leather. And I've had, I'm a, like I said, a shoe freak. And I, I've had those shoes for 20 years. I buy I buy some expensive stuff and keep it forever. Okay. I, I mean, I also do the middle of the road or whatever. Love a bargain. But some of these mainstay pieces I've had with me forever, and I don't regret paying the money for them. Oh, there's Huntsville. Now, did you try to match the? font color of Huntsville with your pants in this photo? No, this was all serendipitous. It just happened. So 
we did a photo shoot for uh, a it's a an Instagram account barefooted around the world okay. and she asked me to do some photos so I wanted to showcase Huntsville and that was just one of the outfits I changed there's her bare feet into right there. yeah yeah that stuff is so fun you know I Does, just, are those leather pants yes okay <laughs> I'm just making sure you know are they comfortable investment pieces they're comfortable as long as I don't have to tuck my shirt in you know because they <laughs> they go like so low you know that was one of the low when the low jeans were in style, so I had to make sure my shirt was, you know, tied now, up appropriately. Was that with? Was this a recent shot too? Mm-hmm. This was about a couple months ago, and we did shoots, uh, barefoot shoots all around Huntsville. Really, we got some great stuff. That's cool. Yeah. And here's another Fakashi. Yeah, Brad. there's another one. I think that's the first one that I ever did. And what I love about it is I love the charred tomatoes. That is delicious. Um, and that's another thing about the finesse of the focaccia art is you have to know what's it going to look like when it's cooked? What do you want to be charged? Mm. I mean, charred. Mm-hmm. What do you want to, um, to not be? And you have to figure out how to do that. And with this one, I used grapeseed oil to coat the vegetables because it has a higher smoke point. So mm-hmm. I could let it cook longer and really get those those vegetables to just char as a that was a delicious one for sure does grapeseed oil have a higher smoke point than avocado oil do you know i don't i think i use avocado, a lot of avo- I, I think lot of avocado, avocado oil they're probably in the same, same range but much more than olive oil yeah i use avocado almost exclusively outside do you for, so it really helps you with mm-hmm. your high temps that's good mm-hmm. yeah. that's good and I think that might be it, Paula, oh, as far wow. as the, the pictures that we had. Oh, no, no. no oh, no. there's my Southern that, Buttermilk Biscuits. Now that looks yeah. just delectable. That's uh, that's some fine stuff right there. <laughs> I don't usually eat my food because I'd be 300 pounds if I did. <laughs> but I ate one of those. Uh, that's just a strawberry shortcake with, you know. With my biscuits. So this is similar to what you would have provided at your brunch at Sweets in Memphis? Yeah, yes, absolutely. I mean, there were so many toppings, it was unbelievable. And that's a focaccia breadboard that I used the pansies. And then I also used beets, orange beets. Mm -hmm. You can see those. And then the red onion and uh, some peppers, little slices of peppers. Are Um, there a lot of other bakers who do this? No, not really. There's one woman that I follow on Instagram, and and I I credit her in my uh, website entries. She's really gotten on the trend, and so I I love food art. It's something I I enjoy, and I like to kind of push the envelope on things, so I'm happy that people are recognizing that. And here's your... your, Oh, man, my, my laptop is... There you go. There we go. So... I did a series on YouTube called Footwear Friday. And you know what? I had to stop. Do you know why I had to stop? No. I pretty much ran out of shoes. Really? Like the boots and stuff. I did. I was like, well, okay. Time to go back to the store. Hello, (laughs) rulala.com. You know? Yeah. But it was so fun and people loved it. I mean, and it's what's hilarious about it. It wasn't just women. Men loved it too. I mean, Mm -hmm. people love shoes. So I would showcase different shoes and what they were about and what they meant to me and why they were cool. And then some of the episodes, I'd have them choose which one I should I should do. So That's cool. I'll buy some more shoes and do that later, but my plate's kind of full right now. Now, this is your mm-hmm. father? That's my father, Michael Namchef, on the left, uh, with, I think, Fletcher Kurtz is on the right. So this is him at NASA. You see the pocket protectors, mm-hmm. all the pins. Big the skinny, nerds. Total nerds. Total <laughs> nerds. You're a food nerd and he's I'm a, a... I'm a food nerd and he's a nerd. That's why when I took the brand <clears throat> cereal to school in the first grade, he was like, oh, that's pretty interesting, Paula. My mom was like, oh my God, what is she doing? <laughs> but he he was amazing. He, he was, you know, a, a northerner through and through. Um, and he moved here when he was... 30 or 29 or 30 to so start he's in this his, job. He's in his like mid thir- yes. early 30s here? Yes, he is. Do you know what I notice here stylistically in this picture? Should I guess or do you, is it e- is it easy? Well, 
those those small skinny ties are back in yes. style, right? Like, yes. I would have never no. ever worn one of those like when they started to dress like nicely in like the '90s or early 2000s. Right, right. Then you look at how just fashion just cycles it, through, it right? It does. It does. And here we are back through. to the skinny little tie. Yeah. We really, really are. No, I'm not going to wear it. I'm still not going to wear that small of a tie. But, yeah, that's kind of... But some people do. That almost looks like a scarf. <laughs> yeah, but they're back. you got to be bold. Yeah, they are back. Now, here's your Barnabas. Now, I this, think, right? So, now, this one is Izzy. This oh, is Izzy? Isabel. That's so, a- she's my other adopted dachshund. Um, I'm a dachshund fanatic, but then I also really believe in rescues. Mm-hmm. I think we all need to adopt and not shop. There's... If you... Open your world to that and the need, you'll get it. Yeah. Um, and so she was adopted five years ago, and she's just hilarious. She smiles with her big teeth all the time, and mm-hmm. she's just a love bug. She, and then this is my Barnabas. So Barnabas is famous, actually. Um, I've posted a lot about him on my Facebook page over the years. He was an incredibly exceptional dog. Mm -hmm. He, I'll go through it quickly. I adopted him up in the mountains, Pisgah, Alabama. I adopted him from a picture I saw of him with mange all over his body, including his eyes. His eyes were shut. He was discovered eating cat food in a backyard Mm. somewhere. So they brought him into the, to the sanctuary, right? And, they were going to put him down because he was in such bad shape. And there were all these dogs barking. And this this shelter was just bare bones, no heat or anything, just concrete blocks. And he, they said he never barked but one time during the whole time he was there. Because, really? like, you know, he was just frightened. But he lived on the street. The, what the vets said when they found him was it, literally this. No dog gets to be this way overnight. And that just tore my ha- my heart in two. Mm. And so, and he was a you know he was a, st- a street dog, and you could see he was so weather worn. And they thought he was like five or six. He's got scars under his eyes from where someone's tried to fight him. I've never seen him try to fight a dog ever. He he will cry, like cry whine happy when he sees dogs. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what happened there. There's a lot of his story I don't know about. His teeth are mangled and, and down down to nubs. They were that way when I got him. He's had his teeth cleaned a couple times, and he does not have very many teeth left here. But So eating was an issue. Um, he has a bullet in his back leg. Someone had shot him. Goodness. Yeah, and his back leg is deformed because of that. It won't, it won't flex properly. So when he walks, he skips a little bit. But he just, you know... Through pain, through everything, he's just he was a badass dog, just brave, mm-hmm. strong, loving, didn't let stuff get him down. Um, for all of the ailments that he had, he was amazing. And I just kept thinking, and it, maybe it was a bad thing to think, but I kept thinking every day, man, I just want this dog to have so much more time with me, mm-hmm. living the great life, even with all of his, you know, all sure. of his his wounds and everything. And uh, yeah, we had a great life, but I just lost him about a month ago and mm. it's, I'm proud I'm not crying right now because yeah. he's, he was amazing. And I've gotten cards from all over the United States, like snail mail cards and messages really? from people that don't know me. Um, a good friend of mine that I hadn't seen for 10 years just had three plant, three trees planting in Israel in his honor. And I've had several things like that. And it's not me, it's him. It's it's who he was. That actually should have cycled through on on this, on the screen, that, that image of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He was something else. And everybody that, everybody that knew him loved him, just absolutely loved him. He was something amazing and there'll never be another Barnabas. Paula, it's been a pleasure having you on. Oh, I've loved it. I've loved it. We we've got lots of other things we can we can we can talk about. So I, I'm I'm loving that I'm here, and I hope I can come back. Do you have any final thoughts? Um, yeah, I just think that it's really important for us to support content creators because they do so much. You know, I mean, support them if their content's good. Yeah, but pay attention to them because it is really it's a it's a work of love, and it isn't easy to do, and and it isn't easy to put yourself out there. 
like I, I put myself out there a lot, like with no makeup and just, you know, like I sent a, uh, Instagram video to everybody just after I'd been bawling, crying, thanking them for the support of Barnabas. I just think authenticity is so important, especially in this age of social media. Yeah. You know how they say Facebook isn't real, you know? Mm. I mean, like, you're not taking a picture of when you first get up in the morning or when you've just had a fight with your spouse yeah. or I've always your wanted, dog's pooped on the floor. And I've always wanted to just post a picture of me, like, mowing the lawn. Right. Like, does anyone care? Right. Like, just, I'm just mowing. Just, this is just life. Just do it. This yeah. is life. Yeah. I, I feel that way a lot of times. There's uh, lots of yeah. pictures I'd like to take of mundane <laughs> stuff, you know? Get no one will care. On. No. And they'll be like, it's okay, like, God, here she goes <laughs> with this one. What is this? So... Yeah, it, uh, there's. I just think we need to support local. We need to help in growing Huntsville in any way that we can. Pay attention to the city sure. and all that's happened. And I just thank everybody for their support and hope more will follow me and continue to do so. I remember the comment I was going to make earlier. I yeah. had a comment and then got distracted. I probably it, got you distracted. No, it's fine. <laughs> I I forget things. But we have. I think we've made... We've done pretty well since moving here to not frequent a chain restaurant right. where we could have gone there when we were in Virginia, or I could yes. go there on my travels. Yes. Not to speak ill at all no. about some of those. No, but some of them are great. We try really hard to just focus on the mom and pops mm -hmm. or those that are exclusive to, in this case, Huntsville Madison. Right. Um, or even if we travel to Birmingham or, yes, or, or yes. wherever else, it's, Hey, what's, what's, um, you know, unique or grew, yeah. grew up out of this area. What right. can we, what can we support, support local? And it always yields a great result. Yeah. You know, it really does. And the other thing is, you know, if a business is off, I mean, sometimes businesses are off. I mean, mm -hmm. it's hard to find employees in yeah. the service industry right now. Um, but to know that, that they're trying and they're making it happen and, you, you let them ramp up in the way they need to ramp up. You give them that time, yeah. and, and they'll be stellar, yeah. you know? And there's just so much here. Well, Paula Namchef, it's been a pleasure. Well, Troy, bye. And it's been such a pleasure for me. I know we've uh, we met a while ago, and we finally yeah. got you on. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of a bonus episode. This is one of those I'm going to, um, that helps me, because I may not be able to record Thanksgiving week or Christmas sure. week. and. Yeah. You know, well, uh, it just kind of helps me get ahead of the game. Right. But uh, but I wish you all the best. Thank you. I know our paths will continue to cross. Oh, I, they will. I can't wait to be on your show. Yes, yes. We got to get a calendar date for you. Maybe we'll just go ahead and do the My Memphis style um, bologna sandwiches. You need or to do that. It's, you, it's fun. <sighs> fried bologna. I grew up on fried bologna yeah. on white bread with yellow mustard. We could do burria. I've really gotten oh, into Berea. You have? Oh, yeah, that's good stuff. Oh, okay. And it's we actually totally better the next that. day. Berea is one of those that it's better the next day. It yes. needs time to marinate. It does need time. You know, Hops and Guac. Hmm. I interviewed uh, the owner there a year ago, and he introduced me to those Berea's yeah. tacos. And I was like, so oh my good. God, this is unbelievable. Slow roasted, you know, just. Yep. falls off you know the the beef falls off the bone it's yeah. just gorgeous and that dipping sauce yeah and the cheese layer it's, it's yeah good stuff. i know that uh, me too god that's good stuff well so, paula you uh all the best to you thank you and we'll see you soon yeah all the best to you i'm so excited about what you're doing well, i appreciate it thank you for spread having the me word on. oh likewise you know i will have a good one